So then I've been in YWAM over 30 years. And yeah, I was 10 years in Afghanistan. I was in Iran. I got out, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> the DTS is like, we've already heard it. <laughs> and then, and then, yeah, I was in Colorado for eight years, and now I've been in Hawaii in our training center there in Kona for 15 years. And you know the struggle with hearing God, yeah, like you're not always sure? When God said, go to Hawaii, I felt peace right away. <laughs> <laughs> like I knew it was God, right? So you got to go. Uh, my younger sister is my hero, too. She does a DTS at age 19, and God speaks to her, go to Kashmir in northern India. And she gets married, raises four kids for 25 years living in Kashmir in north India. <laughs> so all the three kids became missionaries, so my parents are like, if we ever want to see our kids, we got to join YWAM. <laughs> and they joined YWAM. <laughs> Blessed with a very godly mom. When she found out I was in prison in Iran, in the first public prayer meeting, this is what she prayed. God, I pray that Dan does not get out of prison till all your purposes are fulfilled. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, mom. <laughs> Man, I'm glad somebody else was praying. <laughs> God, get him out. <laughs> but that's my mom. She always put the calling of God and the dreams of God above her own. And I love that about her. She's actually written a book, Releasing Your Children to the Lord. The number one challenge for young people today who want to do missions, but there's a struggle, comes usually from their parents. For different reasons, encouraging them not to go. And my mom's like, I see it as a gift of God that my kids chose a different life. And she just sees it as a blessing in her life that her kids all became missionaries. And so I'm living, my dad went to heaven and my mom's with me in Hawaii, <laughs> working with schools at our YWAM base there. Oh, I could tell you so many stories about what God is doing. This year, I had the privilege to go to Greenland. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Greenland? <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> There, somewhere. It's cold, <laughs> a lot of ice. Uh, it had been many months, and me and three other friends had prayed about going to Greenland. The connecting point was in Iceland in the transit lounge of the airport where we would meet up and actually get the flight into Greenland. As we're there, we're meeting up, and we get close to the time of the flight. And right on the marquee, an hour before the flight to Greenland, was a big notice, all flights to Greenland are canceled because of weather there. So we call Icelandic Air, and they're like, yes, we cannot fly because of the weather there. We can give you a hotel since you have a reservation for today, but yeah, we, that's all we can do. And most likely tomorrow, all flights will be canceled to Greenland as well. So we wake up from the hotel, and then we get up in the morning, get in a little circle, us four. We call Icelandic Air, and they're like, yep, all flights to Greenland are canceled today. So we're in the circle praying and thinking, okay, what do we do now? We can't go to Greenland. And my friend says, no, as we're praying, I think we're supposed to go back to the airport. And my friend looks at me and goes, yeah, I feel airport too. And I'm like, yeah, I got airport. <laughs> I mean, there's no flights, but we can go to the airport. <laughs> Why not? So we go to the airport. We go to the head of the airport. Sir, we've heard from the airline there's no flights to Greenland today. We would just want that confirmation from you. And he's like, yes, there are no flights to Greenland today because of weather there. I'm like, thank you. So then we get in a circle again, and we start praying. My friend's like, I think we're supposed to wait three hours. And my other friend's like, oh, my gosh, I got the number three. <laughs> and then my other friend's like, yeah, I got the word wait, too. So we decided to wait three hours. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Obey Jesus. Amen? <laughs> so after two and a half hours, my leg starts to jiggle. I think it's my phone. And I take it out, and it's a boarding pass for 5 p.m. that night to Greenland. <laughs> We're like, there's no flights to Greenland. <laughs> so I take it to the head of the airport, and I'm like, sir, 
there's no flights to Greenland, right? He'd go, yeah, yeah, no flights to Greenland. I said, what do I do with this boarding pass? He says, I don't know. <laughs> so I go back with my friends. We all had boarding passes on our phone. So we She's like, they don't know yet. <laughs> uh, how does that work? <laughs> she goes, well, we kind of have many of the flights anyway, and we told them, but I don't think it's gone through their, you know, <clears throat> knowledge yet that there's actually a plane. But we got the clearance from Greenland, and we got a plane, and we got a pilot, and we're going. <laughs> so I show them my boarding pass. Is this right? She's like, oh, yeah, you're going. <laughs> and we went to Greenland. <laughs> There was only eight people on the plane, me and my three other friends and four others. The plane sat over 100. We're like, is it usually empty? She's like, no, it was totally booked full, but you're the only eight that were actually here who could actually go. So we meet one of the girls who was a First Nation or a local Eskimo person of Greenland and get to know her. The next day, she invites us to go to her work on the way to her work, the Holy Spirit says, go buy her a Bible, because they have Bibles in the Greenlandic language. We buy the Bible, give it to her, and she takes it. And three months later, she texts my friends, I read the book you gave me, and I gave my life to Jesus. Ah, God is so good. One month later, she texts again. The Bible, the book says that I should get baptized, so I got baptized. <laughs> That's who Jesus is. Amen? Amen? My very last text with Lauren Cunningham, a month before he passed away, was this story. And Lauren texts me back with these simple words, Dan, man can say no, and God can say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. That's who Jesus is. Ah, uh, I just in September went to Brunei. Do you know where Brunei is? <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> it's a tiny Muslim nation under <clears throat> under half a million people on the peninsula of Borneo, connected to Indonesia and Malaysia. Very isolated, but its own nation. And I'm talking with my mom about four months ago in Hawaii. And I said, Mom, do you have any dreams left or in your heart that haven't been fulfilled? She goes, well, 25 years ago, God told me I'm supposed to go to Brunei. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. I said, why haven't you told me? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, but I'll never go. And I'm like, Mom, let's go. And she's like, how? I said, Mom, there's this international gathering in September in Manila. It's really close to Brunei. Let's get tickets and let's go to Brunei. She's like, really? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I got to fly and take my mom to Brunei. <laughs> A 25-year-old dream that she thought would never happen, and Jesus fulfilled it. Isn't Jesus good? And we walked the streets for two days in Brunei. We met one man who had done a DTS before. And it's very strict Islamic stuff on the rhetoric of what kind of is the, what you would know about Brunei. But on the street among locals, there is a bit of openness. And we talked to him. And I'm like, can we send teams to Brunei? He's like, yes. <laughs> and I believe it's going to be a new day for Brunei. We're going to have a YWAM base there. Amen. <laughs> I get excited. Ah. But yeah, I could tell you so many stories about what God is doing. Many of you know my story. Yeah, I had the privilege to live for 10 years in Afghanistan. God is moving in Afghanistan. 
I got to go there last year. I'm going to go there next year. I have friends going there every year. We know of more Taliban coming to Jesus than ever before in history. The Taliban are just scared. They, yeah, there's just a lot of heaviness. My dear, dear friend runs a rehab program there. And the leaders came to him the other day, within the last month, and said, we like what you're doing for rehab for drug addicts, and we want you to set up one in every province of the country. Wow. Oh, how does that work? Amen. Yes. He let me come to his place, and every day in his discipleship, he gets to share about Jesus. Amen. We can hear what we hear on the news, but God is moving. Amen. Amen. It's not just what we see. It's not just what we hear about. But Jesus is building his kingdom. And I could tell you story after story. I had the privilege this week to tell a lot of my stories in the DTS. I've actually faced death six times in my life. And yeah, as I walk with Jesus, I'm becoming very aware of the simple fact. I don't have five minutes without thankfulness. I'm living in a place of total thankfulness. I'm always thankful. Why? I get to be Jesus' kid. I get to walk with him. I get to know him. And that's just been my journey. And yeah, I'm just thankful. I'm always thankful. I don't know how to be anything else. He's just so good. He's just been so good to me. Those of you who know my story, yeah, it all started when I was 16 and I discovered God's immense love for me. And I simply began walking with him. And then, I'll never forget, when I got out of prison in Iran, I came back. My parents had joined YWAM in Colorado, and that's what I did. And I was there on the YWAM base, and I'd already lived 10 years in Afghanistan, and I was there <clears throat> in, in Iran in prison, and had just come back. And God brought so much healing from PTSD and other stuff from prison. And I just started to pray slowly about what was I going to do next. And many people were texting me and asking me the same question. And in my heart, I was like, yeah, I want to go to a new country, and I want to do something for God. And one day, I'm playing pool. <laughs> and as I'm playing pool one day, asking God for a bigger picture, not just where I would go on visits, but where I would actually stay for a while. And I felt like God say to stay on that YWAM base for two years and clean toilets and clean the kitchen. The YWAM base was in southern Colorado at an elevation of about 2,500 meters, okay, 40 minutes from a store. Complete isolation, this tiny YWAM base, and God's telling me to just clean toilets, and there's nothing against cleaning toilets and working in the kitchen, but in my heart, I'm like, I want to do something great for God. And over the next month, there was a, sh a shift in my heart. I began to think about why. When I gave my life to Jesus, all I cared about was doing the next thing he told me to do. And now he's telling me the next thing to do, and I'm not that happy about it. He's telling me something to do, and I just wish it was something else. And I began to realize that I was in an identity crisis. And I began to look at my life 10 years in Afghanistan, Every time I'd come back from Afghanistan, people were so nice and gave me so much affirmation. Wow, you work in Afghanistan. Wow, you're doing something radical for God. And I would just give all glory to God. I'm like, God, you know, all glory to God. But in my heart, the affirmation meant something. I liked it. And then when I got out of prison in Iran, oh my God. People are like, wow, you're like the Apostle Paul. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just Dan, you know, in Dan land, you know. <laughs> I'm just Dan. But when people said nice things, it felt good inside. And now God's telling me just to work behind the scenes, kind of, you know, not be seen by people as doing, quote, much, and something was wrong. And I went to our leaders and I said, what's wrong with me? Why am I struggling with this next thing? They're like, Dan, the greatest title and the greatest position you'll ever have in this life came when you became a child of the living God. It doesn't get higher and it doesn't get greater. 
And somehow, Dan, something has shifted in your heart where you'd rather have the praises of man and affirmation of man than simply do what God's told you. And I'm like, you're right, I need to change. They're like, well, go, go to God and change. And I went to Jesus, Jesus, change me. <laughs> and I found Jesus again. And I started cleaning toilets. <laughs> and I did it with great joy. Every day I was getting emails and texts from friends. Oh, Dan, <laughs> prison must have really got to you. <laughs> you know, one day you'll get out there and do the you know, something crazy for God again. <laughs> These little jabs in my heart. And yet I knew I was exactly where God had wanted me. Yeah. yeah. I just want to live before the audience of one. I don't want to worry what people think. I don't want to worry what I think. I don't want to worry what, like, I used to do or what I'm doing now. No, the Christian life is a simple honor that we get to follow Jesus until we go to heaven. Amen? Amen. It doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. And in my journey of simply walking with Jesus, one of the things that has really been a, been a radical shift in my heart and, and freed me to simply walk with him is this real simple thought of having an unoffendable heart. An unoffendable heart. And throughout my journey of walking with God, man, I've had so many opportunities to have an offended heart. Offendable heart. I'll never forget prison. In prison, I was beaten every day. And I had two death sentences on my life. And I'll never forget the very first day I was in prison, the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I was getting beaten. Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. I'm like, not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept beating me, and God said it again. He's like, Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. I'm like, uh, how, <laughs> you know? And wonderful Jesus said these beautiful words, like, Dan, ask me what I think of him. I love when Jesus changes the subject. Yeah, I was on God's mind, but God had a lot of things on his mind too. And wonderful Jesus gave me his love for this man. And all glory to God. In the coming weeks, God shifted my heart. And I just got to love him and bless him. The beatings didn't stop. I'll never forget the last day I saw him. The very last day I saw him. Man, I was scared. I walk into that interrogation room, but God had changed my heart. And on that last day, I looked at him and I said this. I didn't know it would be the last day I'd see him. I'm like, sir, if we're going to see each other every day, let's be friends. He's like, what? I said, yeah, we see each other every day, let's be friends. He's like, we will never be friends. And something rose up within me. And I looked at him and I said, no, sir, today we become friends. And we can start by exchanging names. He had never told me his name. That wasn't allowed. My name was 58 because that was the number of myself. And I stuck out my hand like this. And I'm like, let's be friends. And that's when he froze. Then he began to shake. That's when he took his hand out of my pocket, his pocket, and then he shook my hand. When he shook my hand, he wouldn't let go. And as he's holding my hand, tears started to run down his face. And he finally looks at me and says, Dan, and he calls me by my name. He said, my name is Razak, and I would love to be your friend. There is no heart too hard for Jesus. There's no heart too hard for Jesus. I have faced this unoffendable heart so many times in my life. Years after that, I was in Afghanistan, returning to Afghanistan. And I was driving in my car. I'd had a wonderful car for eight years. I loved my Volvo car. <laughs> I'm Swedish. I love Volvo. <laughs> and I'd had it for eight years. And I remember driving it around one day, and the Taliban often had random check posts. And they stopped me in my car, 
He had an AK-47. They always did, but they usually didn't point it. This day, he points it at me as I roll down the window. He said, get out of the car. And I'm like, I'm sorry. It's a work vehicle, and I don't know. I don't know if I, sh I can give it to you. And then he comes into the, dry the passenger seat. He releases the safety of the AK-47. He puts the barrel of the gun right on my head. He said, I said, get out of the car. <laughs> and I take the keys out of the ignition, and I'm like, enjoy the car. He's like, I will. <laughs> and as he drives off, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Dan, bless him. Nothing inside of me wanted to bless him. Nothing in forms of justice would say bless him, but Jesus said bless him. <laughs> so I just blessed him. Oh, my God, I pray he enjoys that car more than I ever did. I pray that he has so much fun. I pray that he just, just loves it, loves it, loves it. And I thank you for blessing him with a nice car, even though it wasn't the nicest way. <laughs> And I saw him again in, in a month driving around with Taliban people. <laughs> and I kept thinking, wow, it's got a smell in that car. <laughs> it was hot in the summer. But I just blessed him. I just blessed him, blessed him, blessed him. And you know what? From the moment of blessing him, guess who was free? I was free. I was free. Why? Because I'd gotten rid of it, you know? I'd gotten rid of it, you know? And so many times throughout my life, having an unoffendable heart is not just because it's right. No, it's because God wants to free us. He wants to free us from holding on to things. Well, there's that one person or there's that one situation. God wants to free us from that. He wants us to get rid of it. That we could walk just totally just his child. Nothing greater than being the child of God. And that any offense that's inside, we just let it go. It doesn't matter if it's right. It doesn't matter if there's justice issues. No, he is enough. He's got us, amen? Woo! And then what about if you're even angry with God? You know, I've had that as well in my life. When I fell off a cliff eight years ago, yeah, I was declared dead after falling 60 feet off a cliff. Crazy miracle how I survived. But after the accident, my, with serious brain injury, had been re rescued by a helicopter, they brought me to the place of rehabilitation. And as I was there, the doctor had been very clear. You'll never walk again. You'll never get out of bed again. I was fully paralyzed in both my legs, fully paralyzed on this side. The rest of your life is just to be a vegetable lying in this bed. But because you'll live at, in this state, we want to give you skills for that in the next nine months. And I remember the next day just going, God, God, why? God gave you my life. Why does it turn out this way? <clears throat> this doesn't feel like the way I thought it would go. This doesn't look like the way I think it should go. And wonderful Jesus just loved me. Just loved me. Oh, my like, God, Why? And God simply said, I love you. And I'm like, oh, this doesn't look like love. <laughs> and I remember in that day, I said, God, I don't understand. I don't understand why I would live this way the rest of my life. I don't understand when I gave you my life that I would never walk again. I don't understand these things. But Jesus, I don't need to understand. And I gave up control. Again, all glory to God. But I gave up control. Control of fixing a situation. Control of making a situation better. Control of making something happen. And I simply gave my life to Jesus. I said, God, I don't need to understand anything. And if I lie in this bed the rest of my life, you're worthy. You're worthy. And I gave up my offense to God. And I said, God... I trust you. I trust you. And throughout my life, the Christian life has been that simple again and again and again. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Amen? And as I prayed about tonight, I just felt like God wants us to free us from any offense that we have inside. 
Maybe there's that one situation or that one person or something that's happened that could even be with the Lord. And God wants to invite us to get rid of it, not just because it's the right thing to do, but no, because he wants to free us. He wants to free us to walk with him being enough. Amen. Let's stand.